Uh, so I'll start uh, by the time that uh, other uh, viewer will join and the speaker will join. So uh, good evening, all of you. Uh, to my audience of this webinar, Geoinformatics on a Real World Solution. Uh, Symbiosis Institute of Geoinformatics uh, in association with the Indian Society of Geomatics, Pune chapter, uh, welcome all of you today's uh, third day webinar uh, that is a transformation of uh, spatial technology. Uh, we have seen uh, last couple of decades that spatial technology uh, evolved from the base creation to a smart map, digitization uh, of objects to automatic objects, ex uh, extraction, and the simple classification to AI-based classification. Uh, during these days, that special technology also embarked into the policy and the governance. You have seen uh, nowadays in India, so many line departments, they are utilizing a special technology in their day-to-day -day, uh, governance. And I know that the future of uh, uh, any emerging technology or emerged technology, it's, it's a depend upon the innovation and elasticity to adopt a technology. If technology is not going to be innovated uh, or the some changes is not going to be occur after some time uh, technology will be uh, uh, it, it is going to be a no use it has been proven that spatial science not only provide uh, enormous information a prediction and the solution of uh, outer geography uh, like uh, uh, autonomous vehicle intelligent map but it also contribute to indoor geography and can substantially contribute to smart manufacturing. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you two examples of this that uh, is smart manufacturing, that uh, the data analysis with a self-organizing map for human visual exploration of historically recorded data and, and an indoor navigation ontology for the modeling of indoor production environment and autonomous uh, routing uh, system and the production assets. Uh, last two session of this webinar were uh, successfully discussed and deliberated on hydrometeorological extremes and e-governance, uh, which termed as a G-governance while we are using a uh, spatial technology uh, club with the uh, e-governance. A uh, last couple uh, of year, we discussed that how spatial uh, technology solved that many uh, problems. Uh, if you see uh, that uh, recent years, that uh, Fanny uh, cyclone, which was uh, hit uh, Odisha coast, and utilization of uh, disaster management expertise as well as the geospatial. Uh, understanding saved a lot of economy as well as the uh, human life. Uh, government of India have taken a lot of initiative uh, on the G governance, especially uh, under uh, Panchayati Raj, uh, like uh, GeoPlan, which is that the one of the famous application uh, to understand that uh, up to uh, district level and the taluka level information or up to the village level information for the planning purpose. Uh, it's also reduced uh, that uh, uh, economy actually of the particular planning. Uh, so in this note, uh, I welcome today's session chairman, uh, Mr. Abhini Janji. Uh, sir, uh, kindly allow me to introduce you. Uh, However, that uh, uh, Mr. Avinid does not require any kind of introduction in the geospatial industry uh, because he is uh, holding a very top position in uh, one of the top agency that is called uh, Maxar. So Avinid Jain leads a global industry business development for international civil government verticals at Maxar and is based in uh, Singapore. Abneet has been active in remote sensing and photogrammetry industry for the last 25 years. 
and has served a various role in technical sales and business development. He has masters in a botany and the postgraduate research in field of climate change and forestry productive, productivity from uh, India Institute of Remote Sensing, IRS uh, Dehradun. Uh, which is that you no know, part of uh, Department of Space and in, now it is under that Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, Abhinit, the main uh, favorite area is that uh, uh, promoting uh, remote sensing in environment and the disaster management area. So, uh, uh, sir, I welcome you to chair this most interesting session that transformation of spatial uh, technology and I request uh, that audience, uh, if they have any question, they can send their question to the chat box. Sir, I welcome you to uh, lead this session. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you. Um, and uh, good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Uh, firstly, uh, Dr. Singh, let me thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. Uh, you set the uh, context right. Uh, this is a very important topic today, and I'm very pleased and I have the privilege that uh, the uh, representative from industry is also joining me in uh, running this panel today. So we have uh, uh, Mr. Nikhil Kumar uh, from Here Technologies, Mr. Ravi Achala from Cognizant, Mr. Samir Gupte from Cybertech, and last but not the least, Mr. Rajat KM from a startup uh, known as Hyperwatch. So I profoundly thank you all for joining us today uh, from your busy time. I really appreciate it. So what I thought uh, I would do to start the session today is take a little bit of time to set the context from my standpoint. Uh, Dr. Singh, you mentioned uh, my industry and my uh, background is in remote sensing. And this is where my bias is when we speak of the geospatial technologies. So I'll try to give a perspective from where we are today, where we want to go in the next five to 10 years but it would be very important to set the context with a perspective from the historical background as well. So I'll try my best to set that context and then I will invite my fellow colleagues uh, to share their uh, experience and wisdom as well. So let me share my screen to start. You all see my screen? Yeah. All right, so today's topic being transformation of uh, spatial technology. Uh, but what is driving this transformation? Uh, it's very important to understand this, is the world is changing. Not only the world is changing, but the pace at which it is changing. It's really very amazing. And information is becoming uh, a, you know, part of our uh, lifestyle now, today. Uh, so the pace at which the information is flying in is amazing. Uh, you heard Dr. Singh uh, speak of autonomous driving, uh, the uh, communication in terms of 5G connectivity, cloud computing and machine learning. These are all the trends that are driving the geospatial industry to catch up with all these uh, recent developments. Now, having said that, um, like I said, geospatial information has become the common fabric of daily life. Without realizing, we use the location intelligence or location uh, in general uh, on our phone today. Whether you are trying to find your location or you are trying to book a taxi using an Uber app, you are using the location intelligence. Or if you are driving from point A to point B, you are using all these geospatial information to navigate you uh, on the roads. So what is the geospatial paradigm here? Um, there are three uh, uh, 
you know, um, so there are three basic principles to understanding the geospatial paradigm here. One is the location itself, but more importantly, it's the context and time which is equally important when we talk of location intelligence. So let's look at this chart. Um, now, your location could be a coordinate or a name of the place, etc., which can orient you to the position on the, on the ground. But this location is not enough. When you add a little bit more context, like consisting of roads, other features, it gives you a lot more information about location you are in. You can add more context by adding addresses or ground photos, just to make it a little bit more richer. There's another way of looking at it from a context standpoint. When you use a imagery, as a context, it provides an incredible detail around the location you are. It becomes all of a sudden quite rich in understanding where you are and what you add the time component to this paradigm, you will see what has happened in the past, what is the present, and what would be a future looking like. So, like I said, before we talk about where we are and where we want to go in future from a geospatial standpoint, I thought I'll give you a very a quick historical perspective, quoting from uh, uh, Socrates, um, man must rise above the earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond. Only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. That's a very appropriate uh, quote to understand how the perspective changes when you elevate yourself. And that brings to uh, the chronography of how the photography evolved from the French, uh, you know, the father of photography, uh, Louis de Guerre, in 1839. So quickly using the cameras from an elevated uh, uh, platform like a balloon, or the American James Wallace Black, um, and this is the, uh, the world's oldest surviving aerial photograph from 1860, is from Boston as the eagle and the wild goose see the city. Um, different uh, flying objects have been used to capture the information from an aerial platform, uh, a pigeon aerial photography, or using balloons or even kites. So this is a picture from San Francisco from 1906. Now, from that point onwards, the, the technology evolved when the first flight in 1903 by the Wright brothers happened. So we had the first flight in 1903 and these aerial flights were used during the First World War from 1914 to 1918 to do the aerial reconnaissance and capture the aerial uh, photographic standpoint, aerial intelligence standpoint. Isaac Newton, uh, the uh, laws of motion guided the technology a little further. Understanding the uh, uh, laws of motion, it was noted that you need a velocity of 17,500 meter an hour to escape the Earth's orbit. Otherwise, before uh, uh, below this speed, you are only going around uh, uh, on the earth. So this was used by the initial space pioneers 
from Russia, from Germany, and America, to eventually, uh, um, uh, this is uh, a, um, a French poet, uh, Jules Verne, who wrote the famous uh, book, uh, uh, Around the World in 80 Days, and the novel, From the Earth to the Moon. And this brought about the first photography taken from uh, the rocket in 19. So fast forward here, the first photograph from space was taken in 1946. From 1946 to 1972, this technology remained within the realm of defense and intelligence. So it was not available to the public. Uh, only in 1972, with the launch of Landsat satellite, uh, it became uh, available to the non-defense, non-intelligence application. So you see the evolution from the early photography to where we stand today was a very slow progress. Now from 72 till the end of the 20th century, um, things were moving slowly. And at the end of 20th century, this is when the first commercial satellite was launched, which had a resolution which was in the realm of defense and intelligence. So it was uh, a secret, it was uh, for military application and so on. It's only in 1999 when the launch of first Iconos happened, the sub-meter -res sub resolution data was available for the commercial users. And in the last 20 years, the technology has moved much faster today where we have uh, reusable rockets, we have right-share rockets, you have heard ISRO launching uh, more than 100 satellites in a single rocket. So the technology has moved tremendously in terms of launching all these uh, satellites. Uh, now from a big satellite, the technology has become much smaller, where you can have a camera put into a, a size of a shoebox, and it becomes a small satellite that can also do the Earth observation. And of course, the geospatial data platform, along with the cloud technology and machine learning. So this is where we are. This, this is a picture showing how many objects are there today in the space. The barrier to entry has become quite easy now. Um, you know, there are a number of missions happening today and making space a new economy. Let me um, fast forward this to uh, this screenshot, which is a movie, a fiction movie called as Gravity, um, casted by Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. I'm sure most of you may have seen this movie. Though it seems uh, a fiction, but the reality is that now we are going into the outer space, exploring uh, moon, exploring Mars, and many more missions that we are still not uh, openly talking about. So this is as far as uh, uh, you know the uh, the uh, data collection technology from uh, an elevated uh, platform is concerned down to the mapping side of the story. Uh, it started from Renaissance period, which is like 15,000 to 16,000, where the discovery of uh, the printers and the perspective started. So you are seeing some of the screenshots. Uh, this is the artist, uh, uh, you know, uh, imagination uh, captured on a canvas of a Venice city in 15,000 uh, AD. But it gives a quite a representation of the city at that time. Moving on, the first projection was established by Mercator in 1569, and that became the basis for creating the modern maps that we are talking about today. This is a, a picture of 1572, a map representing Mexico City. And this is a 1860 representation of the Mexico City. Now, 
uh, fast forward the first national map was completed in 1870 and during the british time the british surveyors uh, used this trigonometrical survey which was called as a great trigonometrical survey using the survey chains now this mission was uh, 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 the first national mission to map uh, the entire country it took nearly 70 years and thousands of surveys and establishment of monuments so when we talk of maps we talk of scale and when you look at the map you see the details right so on a smaller scale map there are less details does that mean that there are no details no but when you superimpose the imagery on this map you will see there are a lot of details that are not captured in the small scale map for representation purpose now there is a lot of information in this imagery the question then becomes how quickly can we map this and create a map that that i showed earlier um so it took 70 years to create a national map where we are today we can create this kind of maps in a matter of hours and months now how do we do that so this is where we are today the technology assisting us in creating national maps and national geo intelligence uh, databases this is an example from australia a, a continent of 7.6 million square kilometer and nearly 20 million buildings in this uh, country now the first thing that we do is capture very high resolution satellite images using the latest sensor technologies but these images uh, are huge in size so just to give you a sense each day these satellites will collect 80 terabyte of data which if one person were to analyze it would take 85 years for one person to map one feature of this data on a daily basis now obviously uh, the speed at which we are going we just cannot afford to have one person working on this huge amount of data which means that we have to leverage this data in cloud computing uh, high processing computing environment and use the machine learning technologies now in order to make use of all these technologies it's important to have access to these uh, these images now in the last 20 years since 1999 there's more than 100 petabytes of data but these are all kept in the archive of maxa now these are offline archives storage systems which uh, which uh, you know they are not accessible uh, easily now just to give you a sense of how big is this 100 petabyte data so if you consider one byte to be one grain of rice you would need nearly 200 tankers of this size which is equivalent to 40 times of the current world fleet in the world so this is the amount of data that we are talking about how do we go about making use of this data and extracting the geospatial intelligence of so the answer is that we have to use a technology uh, on the which provides elastic computing uh, computing uh, can be um, assisted based on the the um, uh, the hours or the the size of computing required <clears throat> now i mentioned the data is in our um, storage how do we get this into the cloud so very quickly if we were to use the traditional technology either it would have taken a number of uh, months or years so we decided to use something which is called as a snowmobile which is a 18 wheel truck it's a big usb drive uh, sucking off the data from the data center and one or two of such 18 wheel truck would deliver the data from our data center to the amazon data center where it will become available on the cloud 
Now the second uh, part of the equation is to use the machine learning and there are technologies evolving um, in terms of vision and uh, neural network and so on. Outsourcing the human intervention is still part of the equation where we use uh, the human uh, to train the machines and do the quality assessment. So jumping off to how all these technologies come together to create national databases is in a, in a very fast turnaround time. Turning the two-dimensional images into a realistically looking three-dimensional uh, dish of the world that is becoming core to several applications uh, uh, that were not possible uh, you know, in the last uh, at this point, uh, uh, let me uh, stop here and uh, I would uh, like to invite uh, and take him. Um, unless uh, we want to take questions at this point in time, Dr. Singh. You can, you can go ahead, sir. So once that no, speaker will finish, they will ask a question. Uh, yeah. So uh, we have not put that, no, that uh, uh, student may not, will not ask a question to the chair. So no. the later on, if they want to put that the some question, and if you want to answer, you can answer afterwards. No worries. All right, so I have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Nikhil Kumar. Uh, Nikhil is the country head of uh, uh, HERE Technologies and manages the India and SART business. Um, Nikhil, I, I presume you are based in Pune? Uh, no, I'm based in uh, Gurgaon. Okay. All right, I should have known that. Uh, Nikhil is responsible for intensifying strategic focus and consistent business process to accelerate growth for here solutions in South, South Asia region. During his long association of close to uh, two and a half decades with geospatial industry, he has held several leadership roles in top rung geospatial companies, providing compelling geospatial solutions to government, utilities, and enterprise around um, uh, different geographies. He is also actively engaged with various geospatial industry associations such as uh, AGI, FIKI, SAMA, as well as a member of uh, several national uh, geospatial strategy. So, uh, Nikhil would be sharing his insights on geospatial technology, trends, and transformation. Nikhil, I uh, invite you, warm welcome, and I hand over to you. Thank you, Avinith. You set the context pretty right. And, uh, you know, when uh, I heard from Dr. TP saying that this is a, a seminar symposium more on how geospatial can help real world problem, a uh, few things came in mind. Uh, but since I'm, I'm more from technology, well, I had to bring in this, fuse this uh, two ideas. Uh, one is the real world problem and how solution can play a role in solving that problem. So I will be uh, talking to you about uh, uh, what is the problem which is highly relevant in current world as Dr. Kissing calls it. And how that is re relevant in the sense of uh, the new age uh, technology, especially in geospatial uh, is helping solve that. And uh, in that notion, what is the trend and transformation we are seeing within the technology itself? I hope that makes sense. So if you see, uh, you know, UN has already earmarked or targeted 18 sustainable development, uh, you know, goals. And uh, whether you talk about poverty, hunger, you know, uh, well-being of people, uh, gender equality, these are very, very important topics. And uh, all these topics, if you see, uh, has certain indicators, whether we are talking about growing population, talking about uh, structuring our human settlement, we are talking about the physical infrastructure need by the sheer urbanization which is happening, uh, environmental things like rainfall, temperature, land use, land cover. All these problems have some geospatial indicators. And if we try to integrate those indicators, 
uh, into uh, or one over the another and model that in solving this business problem, you see there is very high intervention, uh, which is very uh, relevant coming from the geospatial domain. One is that it helps you in discovery, uh, in actually figuring out uh, the, 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 the underpinning or underneath issues related to these problems, as well create certain level of intelligence by just mixing, matching, uh, and overlaying one uh, indicator on top of that. Uh, because all these problems that you see have a direct geospatial uh, uh, relevance. Now, having said that, let me uh, bring what are the paradigm of geospatial and how do they contribute towards uh, this, uh, what I was talking about, discovery of these indicators and trying to find or extract meaning or you call it intelligence out. So I heard you talking about mapping and you talk about the you know, great art project. Uh, so it starts from that, from, from, from actually mapping. And what you map uh, actually goes back to looking at geography at, at the scratch. Your planning and analysis, what you're trying to achieve actually has a lot to do with what to capture. And when you decide what to capture, it comes on to how to capture whether you have uh, satellite imagery or you have aerial photograph or you're doing scanning through terrestrial LIDAR or you're using total station or GNSS. All these are basically defined the way you plan your project. And that project is directly inter integrated uh, with the issues which is very universal, uh, impacting everybody, which is you know, sustainable goals that I talked about. It's not for one nation, it's for everybody. It's interconnected. You see many of these issues are quite interconnected. Uh, uh, and so there is a lot of universality and, and interconnectivity. And that's what I'm coming to, that it should be, the way of capture should be so that it is replicable, it is scalable. And that's what you define at the start of the project. The second part, which is very important, is the dissemination part, you sharing part, because nothing is coming from one sources. All these problems that I talked about, that human, uh, poverty, uh, you know, uh, 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 environmental issues, uh, population, all these issues have diverse sets of indicators uh, under, uh, underpinned in or inside it. And therefore, when you are thinking of creating such diverse or disparate sources of information, uh, it, you should have the mechanism of, you know, sharing, communicating. So all the protocols which you can talk about and think of should be available these days. Now there's a new notion of what we call as IoT, which itself has a um, um, ability to not only consume data, also give you data back. But the way it is smaller smart devices, it requires a very low power uh, 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 you know, uh, devices and low power connectivity. And that's what LoRaWAN and new terminology that, that is coming as a protocol for IoT devices are coming into being. So all this, here I'm talking about point in time, sorry. Uh, whenever you have a presentation, your system will start talking about uh, when you start it. But it has still an hour to go, so that's a good thing. I don't know why it is not coming. The second part is, uh, again, depending upon the use case, you model, and then you perform decision-making with a set of analytics. Uh, Now, for that to happen, what is the trend these days? What kind of strategy that we need to have and what is the vision that people are having? So this four paradigm of collection, processing, modeling, and analysis has to have a complete integration. So it should be one consistent integrated approach. Many things that you see is happening, uh, and I talked about the IoT part in the field. Uh, you know, Dr. T.P. Singh was talking about connected vehicle. Uh, you, all these vehicles are mounted with a lot of sensors. And you want this vehicle not only to guide the vehicle based on your own uh, intelligence, but also you receive a lot of signals. For instance, if there is a hazardous condition inside, uh, uh, in the road, the first vehicle which goes actually gets some level of uh, uh, data, which is kind of a message, but it gives back also as to where is the position of that hazard. So it's happening both ways. And therefore, it's very important to connect both field to office. And that should be one integrated vision. 
And that's what I'm talking about, seamless integration of data. And that's where I'm talking about a huge emphasis on the way we not only capture, but communicate and share. And that helps in, in the decision making. So that's another trend that you will be seeing. Gone are the days when you have one system, like you were talking about Android, iOS, now you hear Flutter, web, mobile. I'm just trying to give you an analogy that these days, this is common information model, which can be actually picked up for one use cases in the field, but for the same use case at the office level as well. So that should be a consistent strategy. Uh, the third part is uh, how do we support through different engagements uh, or what are the uh, cocks in the wheels in terms of uh, supporting the smart governance? So there are three aspects to it. One is the digital technology. Now the very word uh, digital is synonymous to something to my mind is an intelligent system which actually performs things either based on the way you want it or without being told to do it, right? So digital devices play a very critical role. And that's what I was talking about, IOTs and all that uh, in this whole notion of uh, transformation that is happening uh, both at the technology level and the way technology is deployed in solving the real world problem. The second smart thing, uh, important part is smart infrastructure whether you're talking about goods, goods could be maps, apps, content, all that kind of things, right? Organizational structure, whether you have ISO, you have uh, FTG, you have uh, OGC, all that kind of organizational structure, which actually sets the standard that it should be a common information model can exchange, integrated, interconnected. The third part is a physical structure, whether you are working on web or you are working on mobile devices, it should be, completely ubiquitous. And the fourth part is the technical structure, whether it is a system oriented architecture, it is web two protocol. All these things need to be lined up when we are talking of setting up this smart infrastructure. And third, which is the most important because uh, the governance cannot do away without collaboration and engagement. Because as we all know, government is by the people and for the people. And without taking the feedback of the people and make them a collaborative participant, the engagement cannot flourish. And therefore the mechanism of bringing, breaking silos and bringing process transparency and a voice from all your stakeholders is a very important aspect that, that, that's, that's what the strategy actually talks about. Now, uh, you know, I have, I'm seeing a lot of waiting room asking me to admit it. So sorry for this interruption. Uh, now, enabling government and enterprises. Uh, so uh, I was talking about the trends and transformation. These are the trends that I'm looking at. Uh, so one is the consistent strategy, field to office, you know, a smart governance infrastructure, which is what I talked about, the physical smart and collaboration methodologies. Uh, then uh, creating, you know, governance. And these are three very important takeaways uh, because people uh, in finance, accounts, they will say, oh, what did I get out of it? You are talking English, you're talking about engagement, collaboration, all the big words, but what am I taking out of it? So now I will try to give you a, a three different aspects. Uh, one is economic breakthrough. Whatever investment we are making should be able to provide us a return. It should be able to comply with regulation and help you being safe and still adhere to the quality standards. And of course, one of the most important thing is whenever you do and whatever you do should be uh, actually not impacting environment. So let's take an example, a very simple example of, uh, you know, a, a utility company saying it's true for fault uh, uh, resolution. Now uh, you can use image analysis and analytics tools. You can use satellite imagery. You can do laser scanning uh, uh, that you already have for uh, as built drawings. Uh, and you are able to actually see uh, or send your crew exactly at the place which is more vegetative requiring certain uh, changes there or actually be able to pinpoint and precisely make your crew reach that particular point which has a breakdown without having to go this fast stretches of land and still saving you know your manpower labor cost i'm giving a very simple example not you know uh, wasting your fuel which is kind of environmental impact and also regulating uh, you know complying with the regulations so uh, meet the requirement of the people in say two hours or three hours. So all these three, two or three things can be taken advantage of using geospatial per se. 
Uh, I move quickly. Now, these, the other things that we are saying uh, are uh, like this. So technology is changing big time. Uh, you know, we, we saw from the mainframe to smart computers to mobile and all the applications is that, that we are talking about. Hughes, which is in consumer and business engagement level, everything is coming on cell phone. So that's a huge evolu evolution that we are seeing. And geospatial is adapting to that change, creating those solutions, which is not only at desktop and workstation level, but actually useful for the societal transformation um, by providing application and services right at the mobile and applica uh, mobile applications level. Second is, uh, you know, softwares are becoming very sophisticated. You have different kind of analysis, historic, predictive, real time anal analysis, uh, you know, aligning very well uh, with the technology evolution that is taking place. Roles of individuals are changing. It's gone are the days when only geospatial professionals used to contribute something which was meaningful for deriving decision. You and I are now engaging and while using, we are also, while consuming, we are also participating in providing. For instance, if somebody is uh, opening uh, a, a, a consumer navigation application, and while he's on the road, not only he's getting benefited out of what the traffic condition is, he's also providing through his feedback or through his own position back to the system which tells, oh, what is the level of traffic? So the whole role of geo professional is changing. Everybody is basically a contributor or potentially a contributor. Economics of the scale, now we were only talking about decision support system 10 years back. Dr. T.P. Singh, if you had a geospatial or GIS study, we will talk about it's a tool. It's a decision support system. No longer it is a support system. It is the system. It's a system of records. It's the system of engagement. So it's whether you talk about very large, complex technology or you talk about simple application, GIS or geospatial is becoming a direct application tool rather than becoming just a support system. And societal forces. You know, everything is converging. Uh, you, you see the mass uh, network of sensors there. And, you know, community doing a lot of things. You have seen geospatial observatories, you know, country level observatory, which is contributing. You see OSM, open street map, which is a basically community-based mapping. So societal forces are becoming uh, paramount uh, important these days. Other changes, other, other trend that you are seeing uh, uh, is uh, the things changing, like I'm talking from office to field, things were happening, you are doing a planning and then sending it uh, to the field. I'll give an example here, for instance, uh, a, 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 a excavator, which is right there on the road, and it has to uh, cut and fill. So earlier, what used to happen, you will create the DTM model. We'll see, oh, this is going to be the level that we need to create. And the excavator will be given a plan and it will go and cut that. Now, when it reaches there, it see there is a difference into the design document that it has got. And now we have the hardness integrated with its GPS sensors or the optic sensor It's able to sense, send it to the field. Field is able to in real time, create the elevation model and actually instruct the excavator uh, and its blade to cut and fill the way it is desired. So the consistent the strategy I was talking about is, is actually happening. It's happening right on the field. It's not waiting for post-processing to happen, right? It's happening as we go along. Uh, dedicated collection, we used to have, you know, GPS, total station, going and collecting, get, getting it back in the office. Now everything is crowdsourced. A lot of things are coming. I'm not saying everything is crowdsourced, but this whole uh, notion is shifting now. As I said, even a consumer is becoming participant. Is a consumer is becoming the giver. Point to point, we just used to see, okay, this is what we want to achieve and this is how we need to plan. This is how we need to capture and then create a model. No, it is very orchestrated. If you are trying to do a big, large program, it's more data integrity issues that we need to create. Other than that, it's not point to point. From one uh, evolution, you can extend that for multiple places. Uh, proprietary to either one operating system to the second operating system, it's becoming free and ubiquitous, open source, you know, uh, uh, mobile, web, everything it is, uh, it is possible. Now, earlier it was very classical. We are creating different application, integrating that. Now it's more embedded, right? A lot of things that you create uh, is you, you hear a, an automotive example, computer on field. So you are able to track over the air, 
uh, provide all your maintenance, all your upgrades, uh, integrate with OBD2 and see oh, what kind of maintenance is required for your vehicle. Everything is happening over there. So this embedded, how is this happening? Because all these application or firmware are embedded now. It's not very classical in a, uh, in, in a uh, uh, you know, uh, unintegrated way earlier it was. From version control, version one, version two, version three, over there you are dynamically shifting and changing, right? Like I, I got this notification that your system is automatically have upgraded and it is going to be restarting again. So no longer this version system is happening. It's, it's actually detecting, diagnosing, reacting, and influence. Now from professional side to owner, user, and consumers. This is a very classical uh, framework that I thought I will put together. So from the observational science to modeling and predicting, uh, uh, to interpretation, to planning, to decision-making, and, and action. So this, this, this is very, uh, you know, one uh, integrated framework uh, that I thought I will just bring that. And then I, I will not take much. I will just try to uh, uh, summarize that in two or three slides then. Two, two three examples. If we talk about smart city, uh, if you see uh, you have different three types primarily uh, uh, of the challenges to meet. One is creation of physical infrastructure. Second is creation of the social infrastructure and then the environmental infrastructure. And how you collect your information, how you integrate that, uh, whether it is area-based development or it is pan city, uh, whether you are looking at intelligent transportation system, you are looking at environmental conditions, uh, all can be integrated and a common information model can be created and a, 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 a stack, which is a well integrated interconnected stack, which can bring in diverse sources and disparate sources of information, massage it and share uh, based on the user case application, either from the environmental, uh, social or physical. Case in example, uh, another, I took one rural and one urban. So in agriculture is always a common world problem. And uh, how to give more crop per drop uh, mission can be actually done through geospatial precision agriculture. Whether you're talking about uh, right from planning to growing to harvesting, uh, case in example, uh, you know, uh, your, your, your combines, your tractors, your implements, your sprays uh, can be fitted with sensors, getting your tractors, getting, you know, collection services on the real time, able to guide uh, the tractor in the right lane, able to provide and sow seeds where it is exactly required, precisely required, putting a fertilizer, a spring fertilizer where it is required and not putting the entire field and threat the environmental conditions. Uh, it saves huge amount of cost, it saves huge amount of fertilizers, it saves huge amount of seeds and also time, and as well uh, bring down the environmental issues that it can actually create. So in conclusion, what does it take in terms of platform uh, and engagement? Uh, a pervasive engagement platform, uh, which allows ingestion of data from different sources, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, sensor data, GPS, optics, uh, you know, other geotagged images, all that is still giving the privacy and access control to the individual which this data belong, right? Dr. T.P. Singh might be wanting to share some information, but he doesn't want to he still wants to control the information that is going to be shared with people. He wants to know who is sharing, for what use. So one is that I allow him to share that. And second is still allowing him that access control and privacy. So that's first part and all type of data. It cannot be only one type of data. The second is enrichment. While I come on and engage at that platform, I may not be able to provide all type of data. Like I'd say smart city, you required sensor data, you required you know, enormous amount of wearable data, infrastructure sensors, a lot of data is already there. Cameras, uh, you know, transit systems. So there are multiple, you know, sources of information. Now, if, if I am able to bring in one layer of data that might not meet the requirement for my application, where is that platform? Where is not only I am bringing, some others have also brought in and I will see, okay, which one is that going to make sense for my application, right? And still allowing that privacy and access control to the, data which it belongs to. So that's the second task. Enrich that with other sources of data. Or maybe the platform contributor itself provides a very rich set of data. Uh, from the third set is the processing part. It should have off the shelf available uh, algorithm 
or somebody can bring in his own algorithm, whether it is historic, it is temporal, real time, uh, predictive analytics, all this kind of algorithm, which can be deployed on top of data and services and allows you know, consumer businesses, government to, uh, uh, to actually make use of it more than ever before is still keeping the access control and privacy that I was talking about. And then publishing and sharing. Then you should be able to share with the named user that you want. You do not, or the community that you want in a manner in which you want. That is, whether it comes from mobility, ride sharing, autonomous driving, ADAS, uh, or you know, in, uh, government infrastructure, business intelligence, all this whole algorithm, this data, and, and the pipeline we call it, which is basically nothing but business uh, analytics, all these three parts should be well integrated uh, for allowing the geolocation services to be performed. With that, I end my talk. Uh, uh, I hope this makes sense. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Nikhil. This, this was very interesting. I learned quite a lot. You covered a very wide spectrum, connecting the dots and converging to actual real world problems applications. So this is very interesting. I thank you. Um, thank you. I would like to now invite uh, Mr. Ravi. Uh, Ravi Ashla. So, uh, 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 Avinit Jain, sir, uh, you have uh, some of the questions in the chat box. So, if so, you can, yes. I was thinking, uh, let's take the question at the end of the... Uh, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah. So, we'll see how much time do we have and we can adjust accordingly. Would that be all right? Yeah, perfectly fine. All right. Thank you, Taran. Yeah. Let me invite uh, Mr. Ashla. Uh, Ravi uh, is with Cognizant since uh, December 2005 and has been responsible for setting up and growth of GIS as a practice in Cognizant. His team delivers advanced and next generation solutions, uh, GIS solutions across desktop, web, and mobile platforms to clients from various industry verticals like telecom, utilities, high tech, and insurance. With an overall experience of 20 plus years in GIS and remote sensing, Ravi brings his career's learnings and thought leadership for adoption of special technologies across industry domains. He is passionate about the recent trends in GIS around enabling smart services using GIS technologies, digital twin, establishing single source of truth enterprise GIS and leveraging cloud technologies for industry agnostic integrated back office and field operation. Today, we will hear Ravi speak on location driven smart services for telecom and utility operation. With that, uh, I would like to welcome you, Ravi. And to you. So, uh, uh, thank you, Avneet. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, Nikhil, okay. Fantastic, okay, fantastic stuff. Whatever you spoke a little while ago is something that I'll be taking, okay, to the next step. Okay, you have used uh, the tractors, uh, how they are, how they are, uh, how they are remotely controlled, etc. Uh, I still, uh, it, it actually reminded me of uh, one of the things that happened with John Deere when a tractor was stolen in the U.S. Okay, no one really went and uh, okay found out where it was. Okay, when when it when it was reported in the police. Uh, they just picked up uh, the coordinates and the next minute they could identify where exactly it was, right? So that's yeah. the beauty. <laughs> that's the beauty yeah. of, uh, okay, a connected world. Embedded world, okay, in your, in your language. And uh, you also spoke about, uh, okay, uh, the field and the back office, okay, and integrated operations. So that is the context of my uh, presentation today. And uh, I'm happy to be here with all of you team. And uh, okay, and, and just sharing my screen and then walk you through, okay, uh, one of those things, like right. So just uh, sharing my screen. Just let me know uh, if, if you are able to see. Um, no, not still, still not, uh, Ravi. Oh, is it? Um, um, uh, okay, one second. Why is it paused? Stop share. And then I'm saying share my screen and 
that's what I'm, I'm sharing and I'm saying. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we can see it now. Thank you. So what we are talking today is uh, about location driven smart services, a way of connected uh, utilities and telecom. Uh, this can be extended to all the service industry. And uh, okay, how, how the recent trends in uh, GIS space and in the industry, okay, with the applicability of IoT and then all these device uh, sensors and all those things working together is enabling us, uh, okay, to, to provide better services to our uh, end customers, right, right? So that's the context of it. So I'm going to talk today about, okay, an Uber way of operations, okay, an Uber way of operations in telecom ut and utilities. And I feel that, okay, it's it's not very far off. Okay, maybe in a, a couple of years or maybe in the next five years, you will start seeing, okay, the BSNLs or the MSCBs or all those electric uh, utility and telecom companies, okay, providing you this kind of services. Okay, they all will definitely go, okay, the Uber way. So when I keep saying uh, the Uber way, okay, so what is it that I'm going to talk about today? Okay, I'm going to talk why an Uber way of operations is what the future demands, uh, what it means and how it can be achieved and how it is all delivering the smart operations like right and all this is location driven okay location is the center so by the end of the conversation okay the key takeaways will be location intelligence okay rightly put by uh, okay uh, okay my all all the speakers before me uh, location intelligence uber like services and integrated operations so this is what uh, i i propose to uh, uh, okay give the uh, give away okay as the okay uh, as an outcome of this uh, webinar so if you look at it like right so this is something very very familiar anyone who has worked in gis okay uh, is very familiar with this kind of a view okay and but the difference or the, the kind of a thought that we bring in is okay from an, from an it world we always keep talking about a primary key okay primary key allowing you to uh, connect okay M multiple different things one one with the other Okay, so that primary key is nothing but the digital thread or the knot. Okay, sometimes we even call it as a golden knot. And this golden knot, okay, when when you when you are in a uh, utility and uh, telecom kind of a scenario, like right, what what happens is, okay, it allows you, okay, the location here allows you, okay, to plan where you need to provide your services. For example, okay, till a few till a few days ago, like right, so uh, when 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 uh, the 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 airtels of the world came in or okay all this uh, power electric power and other utility companies came in okay they the, uh, when they start their operations they have to go and define where exactly they are going to plan their services services like right what is their service territory okay where will their customers be what could be the demand okay so these kind of things are very very standard and one of the primary steps okay to start off okay in any any of the business in fact like right so not just telecom and utilities Okay, but in the context of uh, okay, utilities and telecom, okay, what we are looking at is okay, identify where you want to build your services, okay, and then go and decide how you want to offer whatever you want to offer. Say, for example, you want to start up a next uh, MSCB kind of a thing, electricity board or an electricity uh, private electricity uh, distribution company. So, how do you go about like right? So, the first and foremost thing is you will say, okay, I'll go and I'll be the third provider within. Uh, Mumbai and within Mumbai, I would want to offer uh, electric distribution services. Okay, that, that could be a likely a thing or maybe a new telecom, uh, uh, okay, fiber cable kind of a thing. So what you offer, uh, okay, is uh, what, uh, okay, you, you decide in this case, okay, it's all about network planning. So you can go ahead and decide whether you want to do it at a city, state or a country level, okay, based upon the scale at which you want to operate. And then once you do this uh, planning, like right, so this is very, very small scale planning. Okay, but once once you, you cross that stage, okay, then you actually go ahead and start laying out the uh, laying out the networks or designing the network, okay, which brings you from the city to the locality to the street to the doorstep. All right. And all this, okay, in the form of your networks, okay, that's that's the reason why you why we see all these conduits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, being laid out. I saw one of the questions as to how GIS is being used, okay, in infrastructure planning across, uh, okay, so one of one of those questions, like right. So GIS being used, okay, to essentially plan where exactly you need to put what kind of a cable, how many how many ports, 
okay, so on and so forth, right? So for micro level planning. And once you do that, okay, you go ahead, you construct it, and then you establish the network connectivity, et cetera, okay, and then commission the services. And thereafter comes the next big thing, and that's the context of this presentation. Okay, we, we, I, I, we call it the assurance, okay, the network assurance, or, or in, in the simplest of forms, okay, we talk about the operations. Okay, now this is what is the most critical aspect okay of any any utility company any any service company for example okay you uh, imagine there is an outage at your house okay there is no power okay you will start to panic okay so and 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 then your experience about that uh, company okay is directly dependent on how soon or how well they provide you services and 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 like in good old days like right so you request for a service or a okay cable fault or something power outage and if they keep coming after one or two days then it's all gone okay the experience is no longer there and in today's world okay in this fast paced facebooks and uh, social media kind of a thing people expect uh, us to deliver services very very soon and this is one thing that is cut across all industries right so Customer, we keep saying customer is God, customer is king, and so on and so forth. Okay, and to keep the customer experience at the top, like right, you need to bring in something that that will bring in uh, or something that uh, okay, which will be an all-encompassing uh, information-driven uh, services. Okay, and all those services need to be smart. Okay, and that drives the customer behavior. So in 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 countries like UK and US, etc., like right, so uh, there there are regulatory bodies. Okay, which decide how good or how bad you are. People rate your electricity and gas and telecom providers, and based on that, okay, they get their uh, bonus or they get their funds or they get their uh, all 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 pearls, like right. So it's all quality driven, uh, okay, services, okay, all all across the world, right. And and hopefully it will be coming into India also very very soon. Okay, so with that in the context, like right. So when we talk about traditional services, what are we talking about, like right, and these are representative images only okay so there is no no such thing okay uh, that okay this is good or that is bad kind of a thing but then we have all in our lives okay experienced a power outage and we have always cursed our electric provider or the telecom provider okay imagine there is a uh, your telephone is not working okay the bsnl or there is a water leakage or you are not getting water and we all know how to how soon uh, okay, the the, the 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 tickets or the services get uh, restored. Okay, to satisfaction, right? And traditionally, we have always seen that okay, there is a longer time to resolve. Less informed customer, you you never know when you are uh, okay. The service engineer is going to come and fix it. Okay, and so on. And also, by the time they come in, okay, the the fault that have was created, okay, could have impacted many more customers also. So that's when you tend to go back. Okay, in different ways of how do you get the services fast kind of a thing, like right with all those recommendations and so on. Okay, so that's the traditional way of uh, providing services. And if you have observed over the last four, five years, okay, things have started to change. Okay, with the evolution of IT, with the, with the advent of cloud, okay, the artificial intelligence, machine learning kind of a thing, and the connected world, and IoT devices, and so on and so forth. Like, right, you now have services being provided by the companies like Ubers or Hathis or Olas or Urban Claps and so on and so forth. Okay, where if you need a service, okay, all you do is uh, re, uh, pick up your mobile, okay, uh, open an app and then request for the service and then the next few minutes you are already being serviced. Okay, how long do you wait, okay, for a cab request once you put it on Uber? Like right, so right from right from the time that okay, uh, okay, you have raised okay, maybe in half an hour, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, okay, in those if by that time the the cab driver is already there with you and is already taking you all the way through okay to your destination. Okay, now what this kind of a service providing is doing is okay, one okay, you are you are getting a good resolution of your incidents or your service request very 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 fast, and uh, and then the second thing is. Okay, there is an information sharing happening, right? So there is, there is, uh, without you really knowing how this entire system is working, without even knowing who you want, who you want as a cab driver or someone, all right? There is a whole lot of things happening behind, okay, in that integrated world. I keep talking about the primary key or the digital knot or all those kind of things, 
right? With, because of this connected world, okay, there is a service provider, there is a driver who is already picking up your call, okay, coming to you, okay, and then also doing their work very, very fast, right? So this is this is a second, uh, okay, this is a new generation of service providing, right? So that's what is happening. And this is something that we are all aware. So we are looking at two sides of the coin. And today, what we are talking about is the Uber Uber services, like, right? So when we look at how, uh, how this Uber thing is working, like, right? So as I said, all you do is you place a request on your mobile. Okay, you have your mobile device, you open an Uber app, and then you, me, or all of us, like, right? So we just go, okay, place a request, say that, okay, I'm here, okay, take me there. That's all. Now, who are you contacting? Are you, uh, uh, okay, none. You just, you just place a request, and then there is this agent or the driver, okay, who has already accepted and is already telling you that, hey, I'm coming in two minutes or five minutes or whatever, and you can track as to when that person is coming to you. Okay, so the, the, the transaction is directly between you and the driver, and there is none else in between. But if that is how the entire thing is working, okay, uh, that's, that's false. Okay, because while, while uh, you and the driver are working with each other, okay, there is the back office, okay, there is a back end system, okay, which is monitoring, it is ensuring that your, uh, your trip is safe, it is ensuring that you are paying the right amount of money, it is ensuring that it is collecting the feedback from you, okay, so on and so forth. Now, do you do do we assume that all this is being done by some people sitting there, okay, remotely and working? No. Okay, so there is some there is some artificial intelligence, machine learning, okay, and okay, which are which are tapping onto the behavior of people and automatically taking decisions on your behalf, right? So that's the kind of uh, thing that we are all talking about, and that is how okay the next generation of utilities are also trying to move towards, right? So this is the way okay the next generation okay utilities are functioning. So I love this slide, okay, and it's about four o'clock or four thirty. I'm definitely hungry. And this is this is one thing that I always try to look at from an any problem statement kind of thing, right? In the GIS, okay. So what happens is, how good, <laughs> okay? So how good is the piece of cheese, okay, all on its own when it is not part of the burger, right? So you you take a piece of cheese, eat it. Or you take a piece of tomato, eat it. Okay. Do you get the taste of the burger itself? Mm -hmm. Absolutely no. And that's exactly what this GIS thing is also doing about, like, right? So by having it as a burger, by tying it all together, like, right, uh, the entire entire enterprise information, okay, by tying everything to the location, okay, it, it could be the customer, it could be the network, it could be the uh, field technicians, it could be the back office, it could be operations, assets, so on and so forth. By tying together all these things together, like, right, okay, uh, what we are getting now is insights into what is the best possible solution okay for a problem to be solved okay in the most efficient way in a very very smart way right so that's exactly how okay the next generation of services are all happening and i i wouldn't want to call it next generation that generation is already now okay we are we are already seeing it in the ubers and the olas and hathways of the world right what they are doing is just tying out all this information together uh, okay uh, information coming from the gis cad systems there are asset management systems, okay, there are network inventory systems, there are monitoring systems, like, right? So they know that, hey, there is a sensor, that sensor is not working, or that sensor is working, but it's saying that there has been an outage, like, right? Then it knows where the contractors are, it knows where the field technicians are, okay? It knows the schedules of the people, and by tying together all these things, okay, we are now in the world where we are able to leverage the benefits of an integrated, uh, what should I say, services or smart services. Okay, so I go to the next one. So taking this to the next level, like, right? So how does this entire thing work, like, right? So it is all leveraging advances in the latest of the cloud and data science tech, uh, okay, technologies bring together data from various sources, like, right? So we, we talk about property data, we talk about the roads, we talk about the elevations, we know the weather data is there, there are, uh, there are the SCADA, the customer address, council plans, so on and so forth. Okay, the operate you also have the the webcams, the drones, like right. All these inform. All these are what are all these like right? So just just those information providers. Okay, they are just dumping a lot of digital data, digital data. Okay, either directly or indirectly. And 
what we what's essentially happening in this uh, smart operations mode okay is bringing the ability to bring together all this data to one place okay process it okay analyze it sometimes automatically sometimes through machines sometimes through human intervention and then take decisions and take decisions so very fast okay that the customer is always happy and that's exactly how this entire thing is working okay i i, I take it to the next level okay so what how does this kind of a system work like right how does this integrated uh, system work or what does an integrator or what does a smart operations kind of a system constitute of what does what does all of it? okay so if we look at it okay uh, we earlier in our earlier uh, okay discussion okay we spoke about web we spoke about mobile devices right uh, and then uh, uh, other other forms of notifications and so on and so forth so what uh, the easiest way to look at that is today what are the kind different kinds of devices that you have for example you have a mobile app an android and android or ios phone okay we can we can imagine a use case that you are a customer you have opened a mobile app a bsnl app or something like that you've taken a photograph clicked reported an uh, incident and that's done okay your work is done okay and the very moment the very minute you uh, uh, okay report an incident the very next thing that happens is okay it goes over to the central uh, processing center and from there on okay you start getting notifications notifications about how soon that is going to get resolved when is the next nearest technician coming to attend to your uh, service right so, so on and so forth okay we all would have experience if you are having bank accounts especially after modi has uh, pushed in uh, for uh, digital transactions and so on like right so the upi based payments etc etc so what happens okay you you go and you play, you make a, uh, a purchase on a on a website and it sends a message to your mobile you click on your mobile and you approve that okay all this through happening through okay the digital platform right so notifications okay in the form of sms texts or emails or what not okay all those different kinds of notifications okay coming out then in some cases like say for example there is a pole that has fallen next to your house now that that pole okay might be obstructing the traffic on a major highway maybe right so that the people on the highway need to be the highway authorities need to be informed so if they have to be informed then how does this entire thing work like right so there must be some public api that will publish saying that hey okay next to my house there is a major pole that has fallen down because of which there is a traffic jam somebody needs to reroute okay the traffic that is going on this direction okay so public apis okay pushing services or incident sharing information and so on and so forth and then comes the final the person okay who is in the thick of all this who is the one who is going to service your request okay none other than the technician like right so the technician being a technician he will want to know where exactly the incident where exactly the pole has fallen okay if the pole has fallen how many people would have been impacted by the, by that okay and he would want to go on to the field he would want to see where exactly okay what is it lies okay what is it connected to okay and so on and so forth okay and he will also sometimes want to know what is the kind of line that is going on there like at that place so that he can bring in his right tools and so on and so forth and in some cases okay he might also want to see pre defined photographs and all that like right he would want to have as much information for him to be able to go and work some of those informations can be uh, for example the traffic okay to reach to that location uh, or where the incident happened or it could be the weather okay or it could be so many other different kinds of interruptions okay on his journey from this location to that okay so it's very very important that okay they have the entire uh, context of the information of the incident and then okay go ahead and service okay so this becomes the overall thing and to give a representative view how it looks all like right so this is that simple customer app okay you can you can take a request you can say hey these are this is what has happened you can click a photograph and report an incident and as soon as you report that incident like right it, you can get an sms text something like this okay and then with that okay uh, you can click on it and then you can see what is the status of that incident it's on and so forth more like more like the sms text and so on right and then you have the smart operations dashboard okay this is what you we, we talk about from a control center or a back office kind of a view right so you you know what are the incidents that have happened okay what are the nearby incidents okay sometimes it is relevant to know what all incidents have happened okay from the location from there you have got uh, okay a report 
right? And what are the likely uh, assets that are there? Who are the nearest technicians? What is the kind of uh, infra that is required to go and support? Okay, all these things are now avail available right at one place, okay, including access to drones, including to including access to uh, live streaming videos and so on and so forth. With that, okay, what we can do, and the system is also intelligent, like, right? So you can, you can automate the system to take some decisions on your behalf. It can also come back and say that, hey, there are 20 people that could be likely impacted because of this, right? So this kind of uh, dashboards, okay, and from dash, dash, dashboards, okay, you can take more uh, what should I say, uh, details, okay, you can drill down for more information, figure out what exactly has happened, you can identify what is, okay, who are the people who are connected to that problem, okay, who could be the likely customers who will further uh, complain, all these things happening and decisions taken, notifications going out, okay, to the field technician, like, right, and then the field technicians comes in, okay, he knows what are the problems, he can go ahead, he can fix it, he can uh, assess the impact, he can report, he can close and whatnot. Okay, so that's that's the kind of uh, integrated uh, operations that we are talking about. Uh, something that's becoming a trend of late. And uh, for this kind of a thing, what does an architecture look like, right? In the simplest, simplest, simplest way, okay, it's about integration of multiple different systems, pro, okay, each capturing various aspects of a service, like, right? It could be the customer, it could be the assets, it could be the finance, it could be the technicians, it could be the material, inventory, so on and so forth. Bring all of them together to that master data, okay, where uh, accessing data from multiple different sources will not be a problem. And then bring in those analytics, the AI, ML kind of a thing, and then take decisions, okay, which are thick and fast, okay, providing you uh, the uh, smart services, so very, very fast, right? So that's that's what, uh, okay, uh, my, my conversation was about. So what, what we spoke about is an overview of operations. This is already prevalent in the world, okay? So it's no longer next generation. It is already, we are already in this, in our current generation, it's happening. We spoke about why it is important, okay? We spoke about what it is and how it can be achieved. And uh, yeah, I, I, I take a pause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. I, I think the world is becoming uh, the Uber. Everything is at your doorstep. You have very nicely put the geospatial location intelligence into this telecom and utilities perspective. So uh, very, very exciting talk, uh, Ravi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next speaker, we have uh, Mr. Samir Gupte. Uh, do we have Samir? Do we, sorry, do we have uh, Samir, Mr. Samir Gupte? Yes, sir. I, uh, I, can you, can you guys hear me okay? Um, we are starting to hear you better, Samir. Uh, well, we see you now, okay. All right, so. Okay. Uh, we have Mr. Samir Gupte. Uh, Samir is Senior Vice President, Technical Support and Global Operations at Cybertech. He has an overall experience of 20 plus years in global business in IT and ITES industry. He's specialized in setting up new businesses in GIS and non-GIS software product support and global partner management. And he has 11 plus years of experience in ArcGIS product support and geospatial analytical industry. I welcome you, uh, um, Samir. And uh, Samir would be talking about cloud security, importance of cloud security during the COVID situation, uh, which is a very pertinent uh, uh, contemporary topic. So we look forward to hearing your views, uh, Samir. I hand over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jain. So first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Singh, for inviting us today and uh, giving us the opportunity to, to present something. So thank you so much. We've been working with uh, CMS for quite some time and it's one of our trusted partners. So we are proud to be associated with Dr. T.B. Singh. Um, so I, I, I think uh, uh, I, I've been watching this webinar closely and I think we have seen quite a uh, wonderful topics been covered. And, and I agree that uh, as far as India is concerned, that's the next thing to do right now. And we are approaching in that, uh, that direction right now. Uh, 
since I handle more of more of a business in India and global, so I've been seeing a lot of uh, changes been happening. And uh, the reason I chose this this topic is because uh, for all of us, security is very important, and most of us don't even understand how important it is. And if uh, we do not have security, it's like someone entering our house. It, that's 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 the critical uh, thing for security. Um, I'll start by 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 uh, uh, by saying that difference in between before COVID and after COVID. So before COVID, uh, most of the organizations had uh, set up which was based in their offices primarily, and over a bit of time, cloud has gained momentum in the industry right now. So uh, the difference is now is since people are going to work from home, and you know, we don't know till when people say maybe six months, one year, two years, nobody has an idea right now what's going to happen in the future, which means we know one thing that everybody is going to work from home, right? Every infrastructure is going to move to home, which means uh, for any industry or for any organization, especially uh, I would say um, product companies, right? You have a product and your people are developing your product on their laptops. Imagine situation, someone has a personal laptop, and the laptop is compromised. What loss an organization can face, right? So in this situation, a lot of solutions are coming up right now. Uh, people are trying to have uh, systems in place where nothing is stored on the employee machine. So to, to ensure that the security is enhanced. Uh, I'm gonna share a few slides quickly and uh, let me know if you guys are able to uh, see my screen. So uh, I think I have issues, but I'll discover. So uh, first thing I want to talk about is uh, I covered the security aspect of it and post COVID, this is going to be a number one thing. Uh, if you imagine any customer's business, the customer first wants to know, are you capable to handle the business? But the most important question comes now is since people are not in your office, how secure is your customer data in your hands? So that becomes the, the primary statement. So if you ask a user today, any customer, the problem question which we are, we are coming across um, is how is my data secure with, with you? And if you're not able to convince the customer, customer will not stay with us, which means that um, we have to have data with integrity without any loss, um, secure access and zero pull fridge. That's, I think it's, it's very important. And all of us are aware of the, the issues, but I'll throw some light on, on these topics as such. So let's talk about a bit, uh, take a talk a bit about, uh, so there's different ways someone can, you know, try to gain access to any decrypted data. So we all know, we, we come across a lot of things, even, even, even not only IT users, but anybody in the world, right? Someone can pretend to be something and try to reach and access your data. Same is also possible when you, your infrastructure is based out of uh, on-prem or on the cloud. So it's very important for us we identify who who is going to access the data. Um, second option could be about data integrity. So someone can, you know, access data, manipulate it, and change it without me knowing it. It's possible. Uh, next comes is someone can claim uh, something like uh, they didn't do certain actions. No matter if you did or not, but that's again what we are coming across. Uh, Next, what I talked about was someone can leak exposed information, right? At organization level, uh, imagine the impact if secure data or the company's IP is exposed. So how do organizations look at that? That's also uh, an important thing. Um, sometimes you come across threats where your systems won't function. You, it would not give the service it's supposed to provide. And last but not the least is, uh, Something someone can get, get rights to, to do things which they are not supposed to. So these things look like a list, but if when you relate that to any business or any industry, this is this can actually kill an organization's backbone. And that's very that's the reason why security has become more and more, more and more tougher nowadays. If if you see maybe 10 years ago, we never even heard about dual factor authentic, authentication. And now if you see everybody is moving towards that. Because as the entire human race, I observe that whenever we, we come across any development, any new invention, 
something, all the threats follow. So the better the technology, we come across with new threats. So when you have a new thing in place, we also have problems attached to it if it is not secure. Um, so a couple of things, uh, I want to share the slide, but I'm, I'm facing some, some issue here. I'm not going to share the slide, but uh, if anybody has can stop me and I can uh, cover that, that, that topic. So I don't have a wide, vast topic to cover, but I want it to be, keep it really, you know, uh, crisp and precise. So we get the right message as a group. Um, about securities, uh, when we say security, what's security for us, right? As I covered, it's just not network security or physical security. Now things have gone beyond. Now we talked about network security, then we go, go, the next step goes towards identity and access given to whom, who can access and how much they can access. Next comes information protection. It can be customer data, it can be your own product data, could be anything. And then comes the physical security. Maybe uh, 30, 40 years ago, all we knew about was physical security. But now since when we move from on-prem to cloud and since uh, COVID situation, cloud and enterprise applications are gaining more and more popularity. So I, I directly uh, handle S3 business uh, for CyberCheck. And, and I, I see users, uh, you know, and the volumes are now shifting towards more of our just enterprise and mobile. This is the future going to be eventually. So everyone is moving to to enterprise solutions or, or online is getting more popularity because of the current situation. Um, so I would say, yes, we, we, we thought that you know, eventually things will move to cloud, but I think I'm sure people will agree with me that with code situation, this has acted as, as a catalyst or it is a booster for everyone to quickly move to the cloud. That, that's what I, I see. Um, physical security, we all know, it's, it's very, very easy to understand. And then I covered about um, information protection. So data at rest, data in transit, key management, lot of protocols to look at. But my personal favorite uh, is identity and access um, because that covers identity management because if you're able to identify who's entering your network, that's the first thing to do. And then within the organization, since I've mentioned earlier, right, the people are working from home or maybe your customers are working from home. So it's important to have a well-defined role-based access or conditional access. And of course, the next uh, most popular thing going on right now is multi-factor authentication. Uh, network security, we've been doing for quite some time. All of us know we need a firewall. The next step has been GeoIP filtering, maybe IPS or HIPS. And then we cover a couple of uh, network uh, security uh, groups. So I, I didn't have a much of a big topic to talk about, but honestly, I'm from business side, okay? I am not a... Uh, as technical as the speakers we have. But what I've seen so far is uh, to the overall group here um, is I think the transformation of, from, from what is happening right now after COVID is interesting. And it's interesting because it is, it is kind of forcing every one of us to look at something which we wouldn't have looked at otherwise. Uh, when you work from the office, people working from the office, no one ever focused on a lot of areas, but now, it's just not your product or your customer. It's about also about the employees right now. As I covered one point here that earlier we knew our people working from office, they have their laptops, desktop, whatever. They were controlled by the office environment. We had control over it. But now when, when people are not in the secure infrastructure of the organization, which means the chances of threats are much, much, much higher than what it could have been earlier. As I covered one example right now, this example, people have their own laptops, they start working on something, they go to a site which they're not supposed to, and no antivirus in the world can be 100% proof, 100% perfect, we know that. No security in the world can stop any threats. So I want to give a closing statement here to everyone, of, uh, everyone, everyone uh, over here at the meeting here. And I strongly believe in that. There is no, there is no, and there will never be. This is again my opinion, okay. Uh, we can never have a 100% secure system, be it IT or physical. The best secure system for the world and for human race is every individual human being. If all of us are vigilant, only then, that's the best security everyone can have. 
If every employee follows the right protocols for security, that's the best case scenario right now. So when you talk about security tools and new technology, that can be more successful if people support that and people follow the right protocols. That's what uh, I have to say. Uh, I would say that I hope everyone stays safe and your family is safe. Uh, little offline message that I think this situation, all of us are in tough situation today and what will help us is being positive because positivity drives everything in the world. We, all of us are going to come out of it. So let's not waste today's time because we are scared and we don't know. Let's, let's, let's use this time as a new opportunity. And then tomorrow is going to be anyways there. So why do waste today for tomorrow? That's all I have. Thank you so much guys for allowing me to speak. Uh, I wish you all of you all the best and stay safe. We are going to come out of this COVID soon. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Thank you for ending with a very positive note. We all can uh, really, you know, feel it. And hopefully we are turning the corner now, hopefully. And um, I strongly echo your positive uh, note that you uh, mentioned just, just now. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Rajat, who represent Hyperverge, a very exciting uh, should I say a startup, uh, Rajat, uh, you can correct me. <laughs> but let me introduce Rajat, who brings a very fresh perspective. And uh, I'm sure the audience here, the majority of them would benefit from the viewpoint that uh, Rajat in Hyperverge has, and he will share some of those. Rajat graduated from IIT Madras in 2016 and he's an uh, early member of Hyperverge since his pre-final year in 2014. He has worked on various facets of the organization from marketing to design to sales. Currently, he is heading the geospatial business of Hyperverge. He handles clients across the US, Europe, and India. And in his free time, he loves reading and debating about football, politics, and technology. Uh, Rajat, I welcome you and please do share your uh, fresh perspective on how you are making use of AI and ML technologies to solve the real problem. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction, Abhineet. And uh, when Dr. Singh and Abhineet reached out to me uh, to share our journey at Hyperverge and the kind of use cases we are actually working on, it was truly an honor. Uh, I don't do this very often, so if I'm a little nervous or jittery, please excuse me, setting the context right off at the start. Uh, let me just share my screen. And I wanted to take you through three different parts today. One is about the early journey about starting up uh, and how it was. The second part is about the core technology itself that we're building. And the third part about the real world use cases that AI can actually unlock and we are currently building out today. So we started off as a, uh, basically a group of friends and students working on various research problems, participating in computer vision competitions, you know, just a hobby kind of thing away on various applications of computer vision. And that led to industrial consulting. Uh, before I go further, uh, I'll just ask you guys if any of you can identify where our co-founders KB and Kishore were at 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm un unable to see the chat box right now, but I'm pretty sure I can see it once I finish talking. You have a clue at the right side. To basically talk about this, uh, they're at a very interesting place. They're in a railway bogey, uh, trying to solve an important problem for the Indian railways, which was one of the earliest problems that we actually worked on using computer vision. So on the right is what you see is a pantograph. Uh, as you know, most Indian locomotives today are or rather a lot of Indian locomotives today, still rely on electric overhead lines. And how they actually inspect these lines for defects today, or rather at that point of time, was to basically have two people, one person operating the engine and another person actually hanging out and looking overhead and seeing if these lines are actually crossing the threshold or not. A very manual system, you could say, right? So what basically our team did was sit in each of these uh, bogies, like in the morning, go to college, in the night, go to the uh, railway station, have the operator drive these bogies and fit a Microsoft Kinect on top 
and look at where these things are deviating, basically using computer vision technology. Uh, so we were all thinking as to what, what this is, what is this value we're adding? Every night we're going there and you can only run one version of the algorithm in one night. If it has a bug or if it's gonna fail, then you have to come back the next day, retrain the algorithm, go back. And if it fails, you, you have to keep doing this. So this happened for nearly two months. And if, like towards the end, the question, even doing this. As if we are losing you. Please. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, it's better now. Okay. Sorry about that. But on the day when it actually started consistently working, we could see the joy on the operator's face where he could see that something which used to take him his night shift apart from his day duty can be automated and he can have a lot more time with his problem. And being able to actually use technology to add value was motivated us to finally start up. And KVR CTO often remarks that if it was anybody else, even this, anybody else in us, they would have decided to start up. So 2014, when one of our first deep learning based scene recognition algorithms went beyond human accuracy, uh, raised around a million dollars of seed funding from some of the top investors in the Valley. Uh, for a couple of years, we just focused on the technology. And 2017 was when we opened it up and we've been profitable and growing uh, every year. And I'll showcase a little bit of the technology as well. The vision is to build a company for the long term, not really make an exit and sell out. Uh, today, we operate in two major domains. One, which might not be very relevant today, so I'll just spend a few seconds on it, is facial recognition-based digital identity verification. So today, if you take a SIM card from a Reliance Geo or a Vodafone, or say, take a credit card from SBI, it's very highly likely it's the KYC is happening through the Hyperverge engine. What would be relevant to our conversation today is our geospatial stack. So I'll come into the core of the technology today. If you see the industry where it's going, uh, where most of AI is being used on top of satellite or aerial images across different bands, whether it's optical, multispectral, or radar, is to do two things really, really well at the core of it, at the abstract level. One is to be able to detect assets of interest, whether it's to create digital twins of various infrastructure for various cities or for tracking specific assets for defense purposes, whether it's like fighter aircrafts or anything else, or just recreating a network so that you can do maintenance better. So what AI is able to do is what earlier traditionally used to happen manually, where people are looking at satellite images or like say aerial images and pinpointing and marking each of these out which is a very time consuming and cumbersome process. Right? Now you can just train state of the art deep learning algorithms uh, in order to actually detect all of these assets at a massive scale. I think Abhinit was sharing that data point earlier that it's terabytes and terabytes of data that are actually beaming down every single day. And to map out even one single feature can take a lot of years. Right? But being able to do it in a matter of a few minutes or a few hours at scale is what AI really enables. And this is not just for one asset, it's for multiple different assets of interest. To give you a sneak peek behind what actually goes into training an algorithm, in most cases, uh, we start off with a small humanly annotated training set, maybe a thousand or 5,000 images. Like say, if you're looking at a power transmission tower or a cell phone tower or anything. But as most of you would know, it takes nearly hundreds of thousands of images to get the kind of accuracy, which is production grade, right? We're looking at 99% kind of accuracy. So that's where a proprietary way comes in, where there's something called synthetic data generation, where you can artificially create large volumes of realistic looking, but synthetic data and use both to actually train the system. During the first pass, it's not going to be accurate. It's going to be like 89% or 90% recall. Post that, the team of AI engineers and data engineers look at uh, look at the false positives, what are the cases where it's failing, and we create two new sets. One is a new synthetically generated set, and another is a set of errors. And you train the algorithm with both of these, and it takes around 10 to 15 different iterations before you can actually get to the kind of accuracy that you see using AI or deep learning. So moving on, the second module, which is very commonly used, which most of you would be aware of, and AI can help automate a lot of it, is to be able to track where changes are happening across the world. Uh, to give you an example, 2 million commercial satellite images are beamed down every single day. And if you have to actually analyze all of this, it's humanly impossible, right? Like 
to actually track all the various areas of interest. But what we're able to do using AI is train the algorithm to detect A, where the changes are happening, and then use the first algorithm, the feature detection algorithm, to subclass as to what kind of assets are going, undergoing change. Because as an end user, if you're a defense person, you want to be tracking changes only in specific assets, like say tankers, aircrafts, things along those lines. But say if you're an urban local body looking at city planning or infrastructure monitoring, like somebody was mentioning in chat earlier, you want to be just looking at say where the new buildings are coming up, where the new roads are coming up, how different localities are changing, how your water bodies are changing depending on conditions. Like we have a Bellendor Lake in Bangalore, which is pretty famous and which people might want to track. I'm not sure if many of you are aware of it, but moving on. This is the kind of technology which is possible. Being able to analyze the entire globe's worth of imagery at scale and pinpoint with an extremely high recall, like a 98, 99% kind of recall as to where these changes are happening and what kind of changes are happening. Moving on to the use cases themselves, I'll take you through a couple of different things that we are actively building out today. So the first one is remote monitoring of infrastructure. So this is something which is useful, not just in India, but various parts of the world, including the US, the Middle East, Australia, and various regions. I'll tell you the problem behind this, right? As I mentioned to you, or, or, or rather, let me put it this way. Most local governments uh, rely on property tax as a primary source of revenue for them in order to actually fund various activities, whether it's education, uh, sanitation, or anything along those lines. Especially in India, with the introduction of GSC, what's happened is there's been a clamp on the number of different revenue sources which a local government like a BBMP or a GHMC can actually control. And especially this year, with COVID hitting expenses really hard for all these local governments, it becomes very imperative that they tap into the existing sources of revenue and see things which are actually missing out. But if, say, a local body like BBMP or a locality in Ghaziabad wants to do this manually and analyze satellite or aerial imagery from one year to the next and do it manually and pinpoint images, that is going to be extremely time consuming. It can take a few months and it's going to delay the entire process and they're still going to miss out a lot of changes. What we were able to do is basically use AI to actually automate and showcase exactly where the changes have happened and then prioritize it based on the size and value of change or what kind of asset has undergone change. That way, uh, instead of actually manually going through all of this uh, data, they can just have a directed list of which land parcels have undergone change and prioritize based on value so that they can go to the highest value first, inspect that, and then keep moving on. Basically, it's an improvement over their existing workflow, saves time, money, as well as increases efficiency. I'll just switch to a demo to give you a sneak peek into this. Uh, this was more in the US, but it highlights the same use case here as well. Uh, this is imagery from Austin over a couple of years. Uh, what you see in blue is the building footprints, which can be automatically extracted and populate how each building looks like. I'll just turn that off for the sake of this demo. Where you see the highlights are the places where the algorithm is most confident that a change has occurred. So I'll just zoom into a couple of areas to give you a feel of. I'll just cycle between the before and the after, or rather let me turn off the change layer. This is the 2019 imagery that you see, and this is the 2017 imagery that you can see. Putting that back and highlighting the change. So as you can see, the algorithm has correctly picked out that a change has occurred in this region, and it has successfully classified that a building has been demolished. That means revenue from this area is going to be less for them. But what you can also see that this is not just a, a what do you say, basic rule-based change detection system. This is a smart change detection system because everything that has happened around here has been ignored. Like if there's been changes in vegetation, changes in the impervious surfaces, while the algorithm can detect that, that has been ignored and only changes in the relevant asset of interest. This is where the feature extraction part comes in, right? Has been highlighted with respect to, there's been a change in the buildings of interest and it's been demolished or say if I have to go to another area. I'll just again cycle between the before and the after. Again, as you can see, the algorithm is able to identify that a building, a new building has occurred, uh, has been constructed. And 
Apart from this, as I mentioned, we're able to subclassify into other assets as well. If people want to look at swimming pools, people want to look at commercial buildings, things along those lines. So this is one of the applications we're working on across different geographies for uh, helping urban local bodies. But let, let's look at the same application for a very different use case. Right, right now, we're in a pretty, uh, what do you say, uh, sensitive uh, situation with a lot of our neighbors. And if we have to actually arm our uh, military forces to be able to monitor our borders a lot more efficiently, rather than them having to manually look at various images, then it becomes very imperative that you have to analyze a lot of area in a very short amount of time. To give you a data point, it takes around 40 analysts, 24 hours, to analyze a fraction of Pakistan. But that's not the only sensitive area you want to be looking at, right? You want to be looking at a variety of sensitive areas. So it becomes humanly impossible to do that. But if you're able to use AI and actually automate this process, I'll just cycle between before and after. You're able to carry us of the world and highlight where we see the high able to do the change and then you're able to subclassify as to what kind of change so you see in interesting ports across the world people just want to track ship movements and correlate that with the is transponder data to see which of the people are able to do that or if you just want to look at say where the new roads construction is happening so that you can see in a forested area if somebody's constructing a road you're able to pick that out or airstrips anything along those lines so the power of AI is immense to be able to add value in cases where it was humanly impossible before and to be able to do this at scale consistently and accurately. Coming to uh, another use case here, the last use case that I wanted to highlight, this basically highlights the feature extraction part of it. Again, the business problem here was to create a digital energy twin for the entire state of Texas. This was basically uh, to help a lot of the renewable developers and utilities uh, plan their projects. The problem today is uh, there is no geomap database of the energy infrastructure across the world. And if they have to plan it, they have to manually go, go on Google Earth and mark all of these areas and figure out who owns this substation, what is the transmission capacity, everything else. So we collaborated with Maxar, or rather Digital Globe, uh, the organization of beneath this from processed all the 30 centimeter satellite images and trained deep learning algorithms to detect all the assets, every substation, every transmission tower, every wind turbine and solar farm. We were able to do this at the scale of Texas, which is bigger than most countries at a 99% accuracy. So what you see on screen is the final electric transmission line network of Texas laid out. Uh, but finally, what we had to do is create this one-stop platform where any renewable developer or utility could log in and at the click of an information, get all the relevant information for them, which was earlier spread across various different sources. So what used to earlier take them a few weeks in terms of planning where to put their new, uh, what do you say, plants based on various different data sources was brought down to a matter of a few days. And that's the kind of efficiency gain that you're able to achieve using AI and a combination of geospatial. So these are the two highlights, uh, use cases I wanted to actually bring in. And it's been an interesting journey so far from tracking one set of electric wires using computer vision to tracking a completely different set of electric wires using AI on geospatial data. It's been an interesting journey and there's definitely a long path ahead. In terms of closing thoughts, I had a couple of things. One is uh, this industry is currently booming and still in the nascent stage in terms of the revolutionization. A lot of new technologies are coming up. A lot of new applications are coming up. And this is a wonderful time to be in the sector. Uh, the second part uh, is I, I wanted to talk about was uh, a lot of you would have a lot of wonderful ideas at this stage and would be debating whether you want to start up, you don't want to start up. And the message I have for you is uh, stick to your instincts, do your research, and just take the plunge and start up. Heads up, there are gonna be a lot of ups and downs in this process. You just need to persevere. And there's an entire ecosystem of mentors, well-wishers and peers out there to just help you and ensure that you succeed. And thank you all again for this wonderful opportunity. It's been a real honor addressing you. This was very interesting to see um, a real demo of the application of AI in ML uh, solving the real world uh, 
issues. One thing that came out is, uh, is the scale and why AI and ML brings the uh, process that before was uh, done uh, in a very um, manual way. Uh, so now we are almost uh, um, on time here. We have seven minutes left. I wanted to pick up some questions, some already being answered. Uh, Rajat, I wanted to see if you want to throw some more light on this question on how should core geospatial workforce mostly refer as traditional geospatial engineers scale up to acquire the new age AI tech like data science, ML, deep learning, and blend them into geospatial sector. Sure, Vineet. I think uh, upskilling with respect to AI and DL is definitely going to be useful, no matter whether you want to start up in the geospatial sector or anywhere else. And I think a lot of value is generally created when you can combine two different niches, right? Not a lot of people are really skilled in geospatial, not a lot of people are skilled in AI. If you can combine that, the kind of applications people can bring in just because of the different perspective that they have, which other people lack, can be truly immense. So to answer that question, I think it would definitely be valuable. But the other part, of course, is one person from the founding team can have the geospatial knowledge and there's another person from the founding team who brings in the AI knowledge. And you create that synergy by combining or creating the right team as well. So there are two different ways of looking at it. It just depends on the idea and how people want to go about that. Thank you, Rajat. Um, let me pick another question here. Since we are on the topic of AI, and I want to see your views, and it goes to you as well, Rajat, is there is no doubt in saying that technologies like AI is an essential part of development and growth of humans. Will AI create any adverse effect, like destroy more jobs than it creates? It's a, it's a very uh, debatable question being talked about uh, many times. Uh, so you, you give it a shot, Rajat, and uh, probably I will share some thoughts uh, on my side. Sure. I'm pretty sure the rest of the panel members would do a better job than me at addressing this, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, it's As Abhineet mentioned, I think it's debatable. Uh, definitely, the way we are looking at AI is it is not taking away jobs as much as aiding people to do a lot more than they were previously able to do. So it's more of a productivity gain and being able to unlock a wider range of applications. Uh, like say, instead of somebody just looking at where the changes are happening, if we can just pinpoint the changes which are happening, their entire workflow becomes more efficient and they can look at a larger data set rather than looking at just smaller data sets and uh, gain that productivity. The other part or the other uh, way to look at it is every revolution has come up with a set of changes, right? Whether when the industrial revolution came, there was a significant change in terms of what people prefer to do or what they would like to do. And multiple revolutions have actually caused that. So the AI revolution also, I guess it wouldn't be destroying jobs, but it might change the kind of jobs which people are doing. Gravitate from the traditional way of doing it to a very different way of doing it. Uh, I, I'm sure I did not do justice to that question because uh, uh, other people would have better perspectives. I'd rather let the other panelists take that. And no, Rajat, I think you are on point here because I have the same viewpoint is that there has to be a shift with all these transformation happening that we are talking about. Um, humans cannot continue doing the same thing that a machine can replace and do things better. So this is a good time to move up the skills to uh, embrace these transformation. Um, rather than being scared of, uh, you know, um, losing a job or, um, you know, machines taking over. Essentially, machines are not going to take over. The uh, role is just kind of, you know, the, the kind of uh, um, issues that we are trying to deal, the challenges that we are trying to deal, the scale is so enormous that 
even if you put together all humans to the task, they won't be able to address those challenges. So when it comes to scale, uh, you've got to embrace the machines and machines for sure can do much better job than humans. So, so that would be my response. I want to uh, pass one question to uh, uh, Ravi. I, I'm not sure if Nikhil is still online. Nikhil, are you there? Um, yes, Ravi, can, can you connect with Nikhil, sir? I, I think Nikhil has left and so has Samir. Uh, but let me uh, pose this question to uh, Ravi. Samir is there. Samir, I can see him on my uh, screen. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, let me put this question. Uh, you, you did uh, kind of clarify during your talk is how geospatial will help in infrastructure development. Would you have some more thoughts to uh, on this point? So uh, it, it, it has a complete, uh, it has an end-to-end -end impact is what I will say, that, right? So because uh, when, when you're talking about infrastructure, okay, the stakeholders are many. Okay, the, uh, imagine you are building a, uh, you are building a new uh, uh, telecom company. I, I, I have taken that example, right? So. And that telecom company uh, will have enormous number of stakeholders, like right, right from the right from the customers, okay, to the infra, okay, to the uh, the people who are uh, providing you with that infra. You you will have those procurement teams, like right, and where exactly you need to, uh, uh, how exactly will you get all these things, uh, this infra onto the ground, planning on the ground, so that. Okay, you are you are meeting with the regulations. You are meeting with the efficiencies in terms of laying out your network, right? Or optimal optimal networks also, like right? You can't you can't uh, you can't just uh, spend money uh, with, without uh, with improper planning, like, right? And GIS allows you uh, at multiple stages of your business uh, in in terms of infrastructure, right? From the customers to planning your infrastructure itself, laying out the networks and so on and so forth. And once you have, once you lay out the networks, like, right, uh, how do you provide the services, right? How do you provision the services? How, how is the connectivity established? Like, right, and, uh, and is there some preventive maintenance that you can do? Can you do some predictive maintenance? Okay, and so on and so on and so forth. Like, and, and the most important thing is every infra that we are talking, okay, today we are talking about physical infrastructure, like right, this physical infrastructure has to exist somewhere, and unless you know where your assets are, you can't really go and do a good job in maintaining or managing them. Okay, to efficiency, like okay, and uh, more often than not, there is a lot of leakage in terms of uh, uh, finances and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, or or manpower and so on. So that is the reason we keep listening to all these things that hey, this company is under loss. Okay, there is too much of uh, money on the manpower and so on and so forth. Why? Because the, the challenges will come in in terms of your planning. And, that, and GIS is what is that uh, key aspect, which is allowing you to bring all your different aspects of business to one, one place. I, I often uh, keep telling my teams uh, that it's like a graph sheet. Okay, it's as good as a graph sheet. And if you can imagine your business on your graph sheet, then uh, okay, it's, it's now become a chessboard. You are, you are doing the right moves. Okay, so that you can, you will always win. Okay, it's as simple as that, like, right? So GIS allows you to give you that, okay, one perspective of everything, okay, in that little frame, okay? And then you can do mashups, you can do slice and dice of information, get all those insights and so on, okay? But that's, that's how GIS is primarily used, okay? So far, what we are, what our focus or most of our focus, like, okay, even in terms of students or, professionals have been in, in the GIS uh, industry is more around the data capture, the quality of data and so on and so forth. Okay, we have still not leveraged what the uh, analysis part of it or the decision support part of it can do. Uh, sometimes I, I think even before IT had a definition, GIS gave the definition to IT. Okay, so right from data capture, okay, to processing, extraction, analysis, decision support, it gave that entire life cycle. And if you look at our IT industry also, it all started with those IBM mainframes and so on, wherein you're doing your data feeds. Okay, and slowly you started building all those web applications and so on for information extraction. Now we are talking about intelligence. Uh, okay, Rajas spoke about how, okay, auto, automated, uh, automation is happening in terms of AI and all. 
providing you that information, allowing you for cricket decisions. That's that's exactly what GIS is doing, and that's 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 the potential of GIS, like, right? So, well said, Ravi. Yeah, that's a good clarification, Doctor Singh. We are two minutes, uh, three minutes uh, over. Do you think I can take one more question because that's a uh, important question I feel before I give the summary and hand over back to you? Yes, you can take. All right. So the question is: uh, um, We all talk of location data, locational data, and its high applicability, uh, but where do we get that? Most of it is proprietary. What are the sources where we can get? Uh, the question itself is quite nuanced, right? Um, when, so there is a wide spectrum of geospatial data available today, right? Some that you see on Google Earth, which you can use free of charge. Those are the same data set that comes from the commercial company like Maxar. Now, the way business model is, you got to understand, that's why I said the question is nuanced, is that every time you click on a Google Earth, you are passing on a whole lot of information back to Google. It's pretty much like what you do with Facebook and Twitter. You are passing your location, your behavior, your patterns of life back to Google. Now, if you are okay with that, that data seemingly is free. And if you don't mind sharing your uh, privacy information, it's fair enough. Now, there are part of the um, industry that's dealing with challenges in uh, developing countries or countries torn apart with wars and <clears throat> famine and, and whatnot, right? Uh, so without naming any countries, there are organizations who are working towards humanitarian efforts. And this is where the data becomes uh, um, uh, a non-profit commodity, right? So you have Gates Foundation sponsoring uh, uh, agriculture studies or trying to fight polio in Africa or fight malaria in, in parts of India and Bangladesh. Now, they being a, a rich foundation, they pay for the data, but they make the outcomes available free of charge. Then you have open source initiatives like OpenStreetMaps, which essentially uses our data only, which is a commercial data, and it's an open source data, and they create a lot of maps and a lot of information that's uh, made available free of charge. So, there are various ways of getting across, uh, you know, different uh, images. You have several satellite images coming from uh, U.S. Uh, constellation like Landsat or uh, from Sentinel from ESA, European Space Agencies, which are essentially free of charge. They are not as high resolution, but uh, still there are many applications that uh, you can use these data for. So that would be my response is that don't uh, uh, think that this data is not available. Given a context, uh, there are different ways of getting this data. It's not to think that, you know, every time you think of a data, uh, you need to pay, right? So again, so that would be my uh, uh, two cents take on this. Uh, so let me take a couple of more minutes to summarize the different sessions we had very exciting talks covering a very wide spectrum where from the technologies that collect the data, at least from the earth observation side, um, technologies and how they are transforming the way we are addressing the new challenges of the world. We spoke of those 17 sustainable development goals and Nikhil spoke about, uh, you know, how the trends and transformations are helping address those 17 sustainable development goals. He brought about how paradigms of geospatial technology is closely linked with SDGs of the United Nations. Um, he proposed to develop an integrated and consistent strategy for data analysis and decision making. He stressed on developing a smart society enabled with spatial intelligence 
as geospatial technology has developed itself as an evolving system. Now, Ravi brought a very uh, uh, interesting take on how the telecom and utility industry from a very traditional standpoint and where it is going from a Uber way of addressing the telecom and the utility needs um, today. So, um, so Ravi was uh, focused on the use of geospatial technology in telecom and utility services. He proposed to adopt Uber way of uh, operation in telecom and utility services. He focused on developing a quality driven services, smart services option to gain the, the trust of the customers. In this scenario, spatial intelligence like uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning may play a crucial role by analyzing large data sets generated from different sources and available on different scales. <clears throat> now, Samir brought a different perspective to our discussion today. It wasn't purely based on the geospatial uh, discussion. Nevertheless, it was very important to hear the security aspects as the industry is moving on to the cloud. Uh, at the same time, the security aspects are also uh, increasing. So he brought that perspective to the discussion. Uh, last but not the least, Rajat took a very fresh approach and it's very exciting to see from 2016 to 2020 in four years time, right after his graduation, he is managing a business of more than a million dollar and he strongly believes that there is a wide market out there for uh, um, you know, new uh, startups to flourish in this wide ecosystem. There are new challenges all the time coming, which demand that we think differently than from a very traditional way of looking at the geospatial industry. So I was very happy to see Rajat actually demonstrate the applications of AI and ML in the real world problem uh, and also handle the issues of Texas. Texas in many sense is like any, uh, a, like a large country, right? Uh, Texas is, is a huge size uh, in itself. And he mentioned that, you know, going through a traditional interpretation of satellite imagery, it would have taken either a number of years, uh, but bringing AI and ML not only brought the cost efficiencies, but also brought the time and other kind of efficiencies. So with that, I think I am very pleased to, uh, uh, you know, I'm very pleased with the overall session uh, at this point in time, let me hand it back to Dr. Singh for his closing remarks. And I would like to thank all the panelists for taking this time out. I really appreciate that for you to share your valuable insight with the audience today. Uh, thank you, uh, Abhinit uh, Janji. Uh, thank you for that uh, excellent session. And you steered this uh, session uh, very well, in fact. and. Uh, uh, I've I seen that last uh, three session, and this is that the one session where that is, uh, viewers have seen the advancement of a geospatial technology from the, the base to what we are now seeing in, uh, in this uh, technology. Uh, uh, that uh, speakers, they spoke uh, very well about that advancement of a geospatial technology, if you'll see, uh, the nickel that when he mentioning about the SDG goal uh, and SDG goal that Sendai framework says uh, that all, out of the 17 almost uh, uh, that the 12 uh, goals of that SDG directly related to that uh, geospatial uh, technology. Uh, either that uh, it is uh, uh, the extraction of information or the providing that information uh, to the uh, uh, general public. Uh, then uh, coming to this uh, Sendai framework signatory that we are that India is that the one of the signatory. So priority four of the Sendai framework says that uh, utilization of geospatial technology is that important. And uh, we are a signatory so that each and every line department needs to use a geospatial technology, especially in the disaster management. So very well said by that uh, uh, Nikhil and very well uh, uh, connected with that uh, uh, geospatial technology. Then uh, I see that the Ravi, he has uh, uh, really uh, uh, come up with that you know, very 
uh, innovative things where that you know the back office how it is marrying with the ai and the gi so that is the marry of uh, ai and gi provide you information not only the ai it's the uh, geospatial or geo intelligence is also working behind that so that's a very good or very important aspects uh, communicated by uh, ravi to the uh, viewers uh, coming towards uh, that uh, samir he has spoken uh, and that's a real uh, time uh, problem actually uh, i i was talking to uh, samir in uh, other day and he was mentioning that how he has faced this problem that uh, data security and the server security problem and they, he faced that real uh, situation and how he, he has solved that uh, problem and that is going to be happen when we are moving that uh, abneet has rightly mentioned what they are while we are moving towards the cloud security is the major issues and not but the least that uh, rajat he is uh, excellent that is the last uh, to the couple of uh, four years that uh, he has shown a uh, excellent growth in fact that uh, 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 i was working in 2000 early uh, early 2000 on that uh, uh, machine vision tool extraction of uh, object extraction in 2002 2003 that time i have not realized that this is going to be as a big business actually right that time we were thinking only uh, is as a research area and which we were not able to convert is as a business which that rajat has uh, done it and i am very happy to see this thing that the technology which we were earlier looking on that now it has converted on a business so it's a very excellent uh, session very uh, uh, um, uh, session where that we can get a lot of information so thank you all of you for that uh, your time Uh, to uh, uh, give us that information, how the geospatial technology is uh, doing in, in 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 the market. Thank you, thank you, all of you. Okay, take care. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all, Rajat. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.